Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar today. We're going to wait a couple minutes here and let everybody get situated in the webinar, and then we'll go ahead and get started. All right, so good afternoon for those of you on the East Coast. Good morning for those of you on the West Coast. Uh, my name is Paul Springer. I'm the National Director for Aero Barrier here at uh, Corporate in Dayton, Ohio. Um, just a couple quick housekeeping things for everybody on the call here today. First off, we are going to record this webinar. Um, so if anybody misses the, the content today, we will be able to share it at a later time. Everybody on the call is muted. If you have questions or um, would like some clarification, please put that in the chat bar. Um, we'll be monitoring that throughout the conversation and the content today, and we'll try to jump in there and answer any questions that you have at that time. Um, we also have a quick poll for you, um, just to get an understanding of who we have on the call um, and who's joined us today. So if you could take a minute um, and fill out this poll for us, we would greatly appreciate it, and then we'll go ahead and get started. All right, so it looks like we got a good chunk of the, the responses in here. We'll go ahead, go ahead and close that one down. And again, I wanna say welcome. I appreciate you all taking the time out to spend an hour or so with us here today. Um, I think we have a great presentation for you. Um, although I don't believe he needs much introduction, if you don't know Gord Cook, um, Gord is one of the principals at Construction Instruction or CI. Um, if you haven't downloaded the Construction Instruction app, I highly recommend you do so. It's one of the best resources for you know, any um, builder, contractor in our field with various things from air sealing to, to um, weather barriers to roofing. Anything that you need or anything that you're looking to enhance in your build process, you can probably find it in that app. And I strongly recommend that you go down and, and download it. It is a free app. And it's a really great resource for anybody looking for more information. Um, Gord is also the president of Building Knowledge Canada, um, one of the largest rating firms in Ontario. Um, you know, a big influencer in that market. And obviously, he is also part of the Aero Barrier family um, with um, his own couple sets of rigs up in Canada doing some of that work. Um, you know, outside of his professional accomplishments, if you haven't got a chance to meet Gord, um, he is truly a pleasure to work with. I've gotten the chance to know Gord over the last couple of years, and he is genuinely a good person and just a, a pleasure to work with. So if you get the opportunity to meet Gord in person or in the times that we're living in digitally via Zoom or others, please take the opportunity to do so. You will be better off for it. Um, with that said, I'll, I'll hand it off to Gord. He's going to talk a little bit about aero barrier in the real world and how high performance can meet a standard construction budget. So with that, Gord, I'll hand it off to you. Uh, so kind of you, Paul. Thanks very much. Um, uh, we really enjoy working with you and, and your family of folks in, in Dayton. So thanks for that. I see we have about 100 people on the call. Paul, did we have a sense? I didn't see the poll results. Can you give us a sense of the breakdown? Who's uh, What kind of folks are on the call? Yeah, we have about 40% builders, 20% engineering and architecture, and 10% energy raters. 4% insulation contractors, and 23% that classify themselves as other. Fair enough. I'm another. You know, I like other. That's a good one. Uh, so thank you. And just back to what Paul said, I've been doing this in the building science world for a long time, but perhaps a little bit of my history will help you as well. Um, you, you see on the screen construction instruction. I'm a proud partner in, in that. Oh, sorry, what's happened here? Doesn't want to have a little problem, Billy. Really. I'm locked up, Billy. Can you hear me? Oops, you there, Paul? 
Yeah, I'm here. I'm hold on one second. Oh, there we go. Seems to be working now. Okay, my apologies. Just need to click it a button. So I I Paul, you had mentioned construction destruction. There is the the app, uh, a proud supporter of that with my partners Justin and Mark. Uh, there are Justin and Mark there. Between the three of us, you know, pre-COVID, we were traveling across the country doing training sessions. I personally do about 100 dates a year. Uh, we have our own uh, learning center in in uh, Denver, Colorado, uh, that we're just very pleased to work with. But perhaps just a little bit of my background. Um, you know, I got my start trying to sell something called a heat recovery ventilator back in 1986. Uh, those those of you on the call probably know what that is now, but I would challenge you and ask you if you knew what it was in 1986, and probably not, right? And as I was trying to sell those products, um, I would say to builders, you need it because you build tight houses. And they would say, do I? And I said, I don't know. So I bought a blower door and started testing houses and found out two things. One, builders who were building tight houses were very proud of that. Most builders weren't building particular tight houses, but as soon as, as soon as I showed them the blower door test, they actually wanted to build tight houses. The problem back then was the angst. That is, I've done about, personally, a couple of thousand blower door tests, probably more than that, over the last 30 years or so. Um, and every time I've done one, there's always builders standing around, the builders and contractors wondering how they're going to do. Always that angst of, gee, I wonder how it's going to perform. So you can imagine why I was so excited when I came across the AeroBear technology. Uh, Paul, I, I found it when you guys were doing the research with TOE in Minnesota and watched it and was pretty enamored with this, I'll call it game-changing technology is where we'd like to go to. So I want to give you a little bit over the next uh, 50 minutes or so, you know, a little bit of where this came from for those on the call who aren't familiar, a little bit on does it work and give you our experience of over 300 houses now in our marketplace. But really the, the crux of today is to think about optimizing performance using error barrier and determining, helping you determine whether it's cost effective or not, which means it's going to be a bit of a, an assignment for everybody on the call to actually do some math and work this out for your own houses to see if this makes sense. And again, back to that history. So I've been testing houses since 1986. Error Barrier is a company, the, the original company started in 1994. Most of you will know this history. It started with sealing ductwork, primarily for southeastern climates, ductwork in attics. Let's make sure we get that duct sealing done. That was amazingly successful. But in fact, it was back in uh, 2016, that 2015, 2016, that they started to think about, could I repurpose this material to not just seal ductwork, but to seal houses and worked with Department of Energy um, and University of California to try to get to um, seal a seal mechanism for houses uh, in total, which is pretty, pretty cool, pretty powerful in that 2015, 2016 range that we'd like to get to. And, and I just love this statement because I found this to be exactly true, a transformative technology that will assuredly change the ways how homes and buildings are constructed, as well as the expectations of the overall performance of buildings. I think that's pretty powerful. I, I like to posit it this way. If we knew that every building could be under 1.5 air changes, would it change the way we build houses? And the answer is yes, it will. And up till now, we never knew if a house was going to be under 1.5. We hoped, we prayed, we guessed, uh, we gooped, we caulked and tried to get as low as we could. But now we have the ability to be under 1.5. It's very, very powerful. And so Department of Energy looked at this, worked through some of the production elements. Um, the work that was done in Minnesota was done with two large production builders. And we kind of want to report on that, but more importantly, report on our own experiences in production settings now that we've done it for about two years. And, and you'll see here again the phrase, has the potential to be more effective, convenient than convention sealing methods. So that's the second assignment. How are you sealing your houses now? How How is it working for you? What are you investing in that cost right now? And so because we can do this much quicker than, than other technologies. So I'll, I'll walk you through, I, I suspect most on the call know this, but I, I wanna spend just a few minutes on touching you up or reminding you of what this is about. And it, it's about consistently tighter building envelopes and verified documented results. And you go, well, that's nice to have at the end. No, what's really powerful is to know this at the beginning. As you're starting your design 
just for builders in the, on this call, for architects, knowing beforehand as you're designing the building that it's going to get to whatever level you want to dial it down to 1.5 and then second or third understand that this is a single process as opposed to writing into scopes of six or seven different trade contractors again crossing our fingers to know that this is a single process or process for those uh, uh, americans on the call and ultimately tremendous time saving uh, out of this and you know here's just uh, our rig pulling up to a large custom house you know looks pretty cool right a beautiful little a beautiful house being built in the middle of winter there's the rig pretty simple pretty useful most of you guys are undoubtedly you're not that world you're not single family large custom you're more like this production setting and this is obviously a different challenge and some of you on this call are going to go yeah, this may be fine for the one-off passive, you know, net zero lead house, but is it going to work for me on production sites? This is a production site that we did in a very successful, very difficult site. This is actually an infill site, downtown Toronto, effectively. I think it was 38 townhouses. Somebody, my son can correct me on that. But this idea that we got to work into the very difficult, very demanding production schedule of this kind of site um, to my mind is is that whole game changer that I want to report on today. Then the process is pretty simple. You prepare the house for sealing. You cover all the intentional openings, drains, bath fans, and so on. You seal. Uh, you set up the sealing equipment and you pressurize the building or the home. You're going to be asking me how long does this take? Well, the setup is, in, and sorry, the pressurization is typically in the order of 100 pascals. Energy raters on this call will recognize that you're testing to 50 pascals. This is twice the pressure, and it's in pressurization mode. So just to give you a sense of order of magnitude. Same equipment, but different order of magnitude in terms of um, the amount of pressurization that we're going to do. So here we are at the house. There's some outside work to be done, setting up the equipment, typically in a garage or outside under a tent, um, in winter, uh, in a tent, for example, in, in Canada. But you're at the house, you're setting up the equipment to get this done, comes on a couple of carts. Um, you are prepping inside, so it's kind of a two-man job, somebody on the outside, somebody in the inside. And you're prepping the house for two reasons. You want to seal off the holes that you don't want to seal, things like bathroom fans and around window sashes. And you need to figure out what surfaces you don't want this product falling on. So if you had finished carpets, for example, finished flooring, finished cabinets, you'd want to seal those off. Mechanical equipment that you don't want covered because the product will deposit out in a little bit of a, um, a sticky it's not really a mess, just a little bit of tackiness that you would say I'm going to cover off. So there you are sealing off. How long does that take? Well, it's about 45 minutes. 45 minutes outside, one person, 45 minutes inside. Some are able to do it quicker than that, but the total setup time in, in that order of magnitude, half an hour to 45 minutes. Some of the dealers on this call can pipe in on what they've seen as um, worst case, uh, best case in terms of that sealing process. There's the control center. Um, in, in this case, in the garage, um, so you have a blower door to pressurize, you have a pail or two of seal, sealant, you have some fluent lines that are running from the, from the module into the house, then you have a, a pump module that's controlling things, you have some sensors, and you have the computer control. So again, this is within that 45-minute setup, if you will. And inside now, you're deploying the nozzles, part of that 45-minute setup, up to eight tripods in the house, depending on the size of the house. Each has two nozzles, so you have 16 spray heads, and you're running air and sealant to each of those. There's different processes out there for high-rise and low rise, but in general, this is the setup that you're doing. And you can see on this slide, the fogging of the house starting. So this is once everybody's out of the house, start the fogging of that material. So you start that sealing process. You begin to aerosolize the sealant. Think of it as a Elmer's glue or Page glue, you know, a white glue that's, that's, it's not exactly that, but that'll give you the sense. And if you looked in the windows, you'd see this fog that's happening inside the house. The house is now pressurized, so air is trying to escape. And as it escapes, it takes with it the sealant, and that sealant deposits particulate uh, across or along the leak. So it's slowly filling in the holes. So the first 20 minutes or so, you're actually not seeing much happen on the screen um, because it's just 
getting the house pressurized, getting the air moving, moving, and but then you do start to see uh, progress. So you're fogging the building and then you're waiting for that process to work. The software regulates the entire process, controlling all the parameters, recording data, verifying the air tightness target. It's effectively doing a blower door test while they're doing the air sealing process. So there's that control center. It's controlling the indoor temperature and relative humidity. It's it's monitoring, sorry, and, and uh, the indoor temperature and relative humidity. It's monitoring and, and adjusting fan speeds. It's uh, adjusting fluid pump speeds. It's adjusting house pressures based on uh, the house getting tighter and tighter. Because you can imagine that the house is getting tighter, the pressure is going to go up, so we turn down the fan. All of this is being done in an automated sense, somebody sitting outside. So interesting enough, well, for the production guys on this call, well, this is being run. One of the people that was doing the setup can be overworking on the next house, getting it prepped. So remember I said 45 minutes of prep time, one person has to be left running the control. The second person is typically over at the next house, you know, hopefully on the same site, obviously, um, getting that next house ready for for a deployment of the sealant on, on that next house. And it's calculating reporting throughout this process, the leakage rate, the time, the sealant used, so on and so on. And all that works really well. It did work for us really well and until we got to October. This is really just an excuse for me to show my son, Brian, on the left and his partner, Scott, uh, working together on this, on this process. Um, and now we had to think about adding heat. And there you'll see a big um, an indirect fired, actually in this case, direct fired, no, sorry, indirect fired uh, diesel heater. So those of you in northern climates, yep, we got to we gotta keep the house warm. We got to keep the sealant warm. So that's what we're working on. Um, so my son is a partner in this business as, uh, as, as well as uh, our partner, Scott, who've been working and now done uh, 350 houses in that range. So uh, finding it actually pretty exciting. They're smiling the whole time. And so there they are monitoring the screen, um, and uh, you know there's hints that are given to change the, the fan rings, hints to check nozzles, hints to adjust uh, external heat. Those of you can look closely at your screen. Look at the middle left of the, sorry, middle edge of the picture, and notice the equivalent leakage area. It's down to 2.3 square inches of leakage after roughly 120 minutes of seal time. This is our own cottage. Notice that it doesn't even register a leakage rate at air change of power, 0, 0.0. It's actually 0 0.06 in two hours, 120 minutes. We got this house down to, you know, it started off nice and tight because it's a builder who's who's done this for a long time. Uh, so it started under two air changes, but in two hours we we're done to 0 0.06 air changes per hour at 50 pascals. So very powerful. Um, and you do need to understand the seal time for production builders worried about how long it's going to take. It, it's really about the amount of fluid that can be pumped in without condensing. So it does vary by outside temperature and relative humidity and also indoor relative humidity and the house pressure and the size of holes. So if you've gotten all the big holes already and done a nice job of the big holes, the seal time is much shorter. And the the uh, air or your dealer is going to help you with that. What we have found is we have helped builders build tighter houses even without running air barrier. That is, we help you find the big holes. No sense us trying to seal a big hole over 50 or 60 minutes when you can seal it really quickly with a, a shot of foam or something like that. So the seal time is impacted by your local weather, your local climate. Oddly enough, interestingly enough, if you're in a dry climate, that means we can pump more sealant into the house and the seal time actually goes quicker. It's the more humid climates that we have to carefully control temperatures. So we bump up the temperature inside the house by adding heat that allows us to put more sealant into the house. So all of that is adjustable. What I really wanna get at it is now the experience of what, Paul, you guys have been at this three, almost four years, we've been at it two years, we already have a really good sense of how to reduce seal time by adjusting temperatures, relative humidities, pressures, and so on. The big key, as I say, is that you get this verified result. At the end of the process, you get something that says, here's the air tightness test result. And the nice part is, we often have builders who stand at the machine and go, yeah, dial it down to one air change, please. 
and we can verify that one air change. Some would say stop it too. You get to decide where you want to stop the process, but you have a target up front. It's effectively guaranteed we can get to that level. Effectively guaranteed, obviously, equipment might break down on any given day. There might be some unusual hole that you guys didn't happen to catch before we started. So, but I would say to you, we are, have a success rate 99% of the time. Paul, you'll be able to add that um, comment at the end as well. And here's the, the, the sealant is really good at holes under a half an inch diameter, maybe five eighths inch diameter. So you do a nice job as builders getting the big holes. Architects, you design in details to make sure we got the big holes. These are the holes that frankly are really difficult to find after the fact. Typically, historically, builders have been laying down hundreds of lineal feet of sealant, caulks, foams, tapes, not really knowing where holes are or what they conceal. This is finding those holes for you. You don't need to spend time and effort on these tiny holes. We can do them more cost effectively than you can right now. And undoubtedly, you're spending money in areas and not getting good bang for buck. And I'm going to try to prove that to you here pretty shortly. Now, so here's our first 300 tests. There was kind of the starting point. You can see that some of them are actually started off really tight. Um, but the big key here is the finish that on average, we've seen a 75% reduction in air tightness. So if you started at eight, we got you down to two. If you started at 1.5, we got you down to 0.2. Always, always a 75% reduction on average. Very seldom are we not able to achieve that kind of result. More importantly, you get to dial up what number you want. You want to be under two? Notice virtually all the houses under two. You want to be under one, under one and a half. We, we can help you get there. Whatever your goal happens to be is very powerful. And, and as a little example of that, first big rescue job, these houses were near completion, 38 townhouses, as bad as 8.66 air change per hour down to 2.31 in a matter of a, a few hours. This is a builder that had to meet an air tightness requirement to meet their local code requirements. They had to meet a code, a, a level of 2.5 air changes. They had almost had the houses finished before they really thought about it and found out their houses, the, the best of the houses was 4.5, the worst was 8.66. And we were able to get every one of those houses down in a production setting very, busy production setting because they're nearing completion so you should have confidence and we were able to do at least two a day some days we did three a day on this job site so pretty powerful um, this is passive house i don't know on this call if there's anybody's interested in passive i'll be interested to take questions on that if if anybody uh, has some some experience with passive but uh, this passive house we took it from 0.71 to 0.3 0.36. And here's what you need to know. This builder's been doing passive house for some time. As he said to us, I can get under 1.5 in my sleep. That's not an issue. He's always under 1.5. He does that cost effectively in his mind. His problem is the big wild card. And he literally sets aside three weeks of production time. And he, with a blower door and his uh, handyman, they start sealing houses. This house, they'd already spent the three weeks, caulk, seal, tape, trying to get down to 0.6, which is the passive house requirement. And for whatever reason, this house had tricky holes, couldn't find the holes. And we got to them, and within a matter of, what's it showing there, 120 minutes, something like that, we had them down from 0.71 to 0.36. His comment to us was, oh, so basically I should get the house to 1.5 and let you guys finish it. Exactly. That makes it really cost effective. You do the big holes, we'll look after the little holes. So in the passive house context, you know, it's, I find it funny. Paul, you've probably heard this too. Passive house guys think air tightness should be hard. They almost feel like they're cheating. This, this, as this builder said to me, it feels like I'm cheating. It feels like I'm not working hard enough. And he goes, but why do I care at this point? I just want to get it to point six. I know I've got all the big holes. You guys are going to get the little ones. That's what I really want out of this. So when we say, you know, we some would argue passive host isn't cost effective at all. I, I wouldn't agree. Passive host is very cost effective, but the air tightness portion of passive host can be very, very cost effective. 
with AeroBear. I don't want to dwell on Passivos, but I think it's a useful conversation to understand where you're allocating your labor and your resources. Uh, a couple of quick slides just to indicate for the builders who aren't or architects aren't familiar with this. It, it's when do you apply? And it's really about understanding what's your air bear. Architects on this call, do you identify the air bear on the pay, uh, on the on your plan sets? Is it the drywall? Is it the poly in northern climates? Is it the house wrap, the weather resistant barrier? Is it the insulated sheathing? Is it the sheathing product itself? First off, you identify what is the primary air barrier in your houses. In the northern climates, we've typically done an inside air barrier, drywall or poly as air barrier. Uh, southern climates have typically done an exterior air barrier using the weather resistant barrier or the, or the OSB itself as the, um, as the primary barrier. But it's really about understanding what's my primary air barrier and when is it substantially complete. So if you're doing an exterior air barrier approach, no problem. The OSB or the house wrap can be your air barrier um, as long as the house is reasonably complete. And well, what's what's the air barrier in the attic? Well, if you're doing a spray foam in the attic or doing a roof deck insulation, okay, your roof deck is the air barrier. If you're not doing that, if you're doing a flat ceiling and that wants to be your air barrier, well, clearly the air barrier would have to be intact in place before you did the air barrier process. But you can do it from the outside or you can do it from the inside. This is using an airtight drywall approach. So once we would say, as soon as you've drywalled, maybe first coat of mud, no sense um, putting sealant in, in between where it's gonna be sealed anyway with the first coat of mud. And there's a natural timing in production. Most of you will know, first coat of mud, you have to wait three, four hours for it to dry, maybe next day. So we slip in, in your production process, we'd slip in before first coat of mud and second coat of mud in that time frame. It doesn't, I mean, you can wait for second coat of mud, that's fine too. But in that drywall process, you'd simply have to ask, is there a half day in there that I can do this? Prep time, 45 minutes, seal time, hour and a half to two hours, maybe three hours, breakdown time, another 30 minutes or so. You can see we need that house on a production level for roughly half a day. Now we can actually do three a day, two to three a day, because we have the prep time going on for the next house. But in production, production builders on this call, imagine leaving the house, pre uh, leaving, allowing us half a day in that house in the same way uh, you allow the drywallers in that house. Now energy raters on this call, I need us to be really clear. There is a difference between the air barrier results and your final air test. This is an enclosure test. That is, we've taped off intentional openings like window sashes, like bathroom fans, and HRV vents. It's not an as-operated test. So I want you to be really careful when you see your results, both builders and energy raters, we're giving you the enclosure or the envelope test. Most of us would say that's exactly what we want. That, that's what we really want to know is the builder done a good job of making his enclosure airtight. You know, the bathroom fan, that's really up to Panasonic or Brone to have a tight bathroom fan, a tight fitting damper. But there is going to be a variance. Don't be, don't, don't, um, well, don't be discouraged by that variance is really what I'm getting at. And the variances are related to these five elements. One, we're doing a pressurization test. You, typically energy rate, are doing a depressurization test. Holes leak differently under pressure versus depressurization. Two, we're doing that enclosure test. You're doing an as-operated test. Three, that sorry, that means we've sealed off intentional openings. Four, our test admittedly is a single point test. The way the software works, you're doing a multi-point test, which does some adjustments for temperatures, uh, elevations, so on and so on. Um, and then, of course, there's a difference in time. That is, other things may have happened. We might have done the aero barrier test just after drywall. You're doing the finished test or the final test. Who knows what might have happened in the meantime? So don't be discouraged by a variance in those air test, test results. But here's the real point. The rest of the presentation is really about what if you knew that every house was under 1.5 air changes? Wouldn't that be cool? Would it change expectations of clients? Would it change your ability to 
to um, exercise uh, time and materials to, to make good leverage time and materials. Would it take out some of the angst? Would it streamline your production? Would it rationalize some other energy investments? So the word we're gonna use is optimization. And I always have to take you back first to risk management. I'm a building science guy. I need to remind you that air tightness is tied to insulation levels. The more insulation you add to a wall, to a ceiling, the less drying potential that wall or attic assembly has. It has less drying potential and in cold climates, it has colder surfaces. You need to recognize and remind yourself, just I'll run this little animation, hopefully it's working. When warm, moist air leaks into a cold cavity, in this case, a wall, as I insulate that wall more and more, the outer surfaces get colder and colder, and I have a chance of condensation in the cavity. That's Building Science 101. The reason air tightness is in the code is not to save energy necessarily. It's primarily there to make sure that we will not have condensation inside of cold cavities. And you're gonna say that's only a cold climate issue. And to a large extent, you're right. Climate zones four and above, this is an issue for us. Colder it gets, more insulation it gets, the worse off this is. But you need to recognize this is a risk factor. All of these slides, these three pictures, these three pictures are showing you air leakage issues. This isn't because we built the houses too tight. This is because we built them too loose. So your first rationalization of doing air barrier is to do no harm. Make sure that as you start adding insulation, more insulation, you're gonna have condensation in cavities. You don't want that. That's why I'm telling you 1.5 is an important number. When you have air tightness as low as 1.5, in virtually every climate zone, uh, colder climates even tighter, but in every climate zone, if you can be under 1.5, these kinds of problems disappear. There's not enough air leakage into cavities at 1.5 air changes to cause this kind of issue. Second, I want to remind you exactly how many holes do your customers expect you to leave in their walls or attics. Just go ahead and ask them. They're buying a $500,000 house. Just ask them, how many holes would you like me to leave in the walls or attics? They expect in a brand new house exactly how many holes? And the answer is zero. They don't want to be wasting energy, and yet they still want fresh air in their houses. So your second big risk factor is meeting expectations. And, and for example, in multifamily, think about if I had good compartmentalization between suites, uh, between hallways and suites, the tremendous noise control, the tremendous odor control. In other words, you're doing air sealing, not just for energy efficiency, but for noise and odor control, and ultimately to optimize HVAC. So this is actually more important in multifamily than it is in single family. And in multifamily, the demising walls, the party walls, are actually often more difficult to seal than the exterior walls. You're already doing a good job on exterior. What are you doing on the party walls, the demising walls? This is really powerful to understand. So let's make sure that we're doing a really nice job in multifamily as well. Now I want to remind you of, of this. Since 2009, in uh, the International Conservation Code, in uh, Energy Conservation Code in the um, United States, and since 1990 in the National Building Code of Canada, these same 17 phrases show up. These words, continuous, sealed, sealed, continuous. When I say homeowners expect zero holes, this is why they expect zero holes. The building code expects or seems to expect zero holes. So you need to be below door testing your houses, 28 states now are, but all of you need to be doing better air tightness because the code is basically saying we need it to be tight. Fortunately, you have a building code requirement that allows you to take these rather subjective words and turn them into an objective measure, but make no doubt about it, your homeowners think there's zero holes in their houses, and if they read the code and some of them have, they will tell you you're supposed to be continuous sealed. Very important. For those on, the, on this call that are more commercial based, you need to understand this. The ASHRAE 90.1, which most states now uh, uh, adopt or reference, in 2007, it used the phrase minimize air leakage. But in 2010, it was changed to designed and constructed to be continuous. 
in uh, air tightness. So you're, if you've adopted 2010 in your market area, you have a new duty, architects, builders, to make sure that the building is designed and constructed to be continuous air barriers in your houses. So it's a code requirement. It's a customer expectation. It's a durability risk. And it's a code requirement to make houses tight. But here's the bottom line, I guess. Here's what I see every day. I see all kinds of work being done to air seal houses, and most of it wasted effort. This is the wrong material in the wrong location. Foam on these studs, in those stud locations, does not actually improve air tightness. One, because it's covered by a sheet of OSB on the outside. Two, because it's covered by a sheet of drywall on the inside. Those beads of foam on the studs aren't actually needed. You're gonna say, my code official makes me do it. He won't or she won't after you start doing air barrier because they'll start to see the results. We use, I see this all the time. And I know builders who are paying $1,200 to $1,500 to do an air sealing package on houses. This builder happened to be in North Carolina. This uh, air sealing contractor is charging them $1,200 to do this work. It's a complete waste of time. This is another builder, at least using the right material. It's a caulking, but not in the right location. Oh, interesting enough, why do they use foam? Because foam comes with a four-foot nozzle. Caulking doesn't come with a four-foot nozzle. So they like to use the foam because it's easy to apply. It doesn't mean it works. It doesn't mean it's the right material. You guys need to be aware that we are seeing tremendous wasted effort. Poor execution, again, of air barrier details. So I see this all the time. I will challenge builders on this call. Get out your scopes of work. What are you paying now? How effective is it? Where do the beads of caulking actually need to be? Again, wasted materials. On the top left, that's a great detail, that OSB. But then they've used foam, inexpensive, fire-rated foam that frankly doesn't work in that location. Foam needs to be injected into a hole. That needs to be caulked. It, it, so these are the, the ideas that we want to think about. The one on the right, using the right material, caulking, but in the wrong location. We don't need those beads on those studs. If there is a hole there, aero barrier will find it. But frankly, there is no hole there. It's already covered by drywall or OSB on the outside. So these are, I see these all the time. The systems, the one on the right is a proprietary system. It's a nice product but they're overspraying this. This was $3,200 to do this house. They finally realized they could get exactly the same effort for just under $1,500 because they stopped doing applying it to all these goofy locations. The one on the left, this builder is using four cases of caulking, sorry, a foams product, that fire rated foam, total waste of time. And then some will say, well, I use spray foam. Well, spray foam is relatively expensive. I love spray foam. I think it's a great product. We need to remind ourselves it's got to be installed correctly. And then even still, it's not getting the bottom plates. It's not getting the top plates. It's not getting around um, certain penetrations. So go ahead and foam and then go ahead and do air bear. One of the early adopters of this uh, uh, technology was Mandalay Homes. Uh, they were already spraying foaming and finding their houses came in around one and a half to two and a half air changes. Why the variation? That's what annoyed them the most. Why the variation? Why isn't every house consistently airtight? So they didn't stop doing using spray foam. They continued using spray foam, but didn't um, didn't try. Well, I shouldn't say didn't try as hard. Um, stopped the other air sealing methods that they used to use around it and used air barrier to get them down consistently. I believe under one air change. Paul, you can verify that later. So spray foam is a great product. But is it really meeting your air tightness goals that you want to get to is where we want to want to talk about. So I just want to show you. And yes, I'm talking cold climate here for a moment. Climate zone five. You've all seen this pie chart before. Every energy rate is showing you the pie chart of the bar graphs, showing you where the, the energy loss is. And in a typical code built, 2009 code built house, 30% of the winter heat loss is associated with air leakage. And I just wanted to show you, if I went from three air changes to 1.5 air changes, I'm saving the order of nine for uh, Canadians gigajoules, which is roughly the same as uh, 9 million BTUs of energy. It ends up being the single most cost-effective 
if you're trying to reduce reduce number of millions of BTUs or number of gigajoules of energy used in a year, this is the single biggest difference. And you're going to go, should I be three? Should I be two, two and a half? And I'm going to say with air barrier, why wouldn't you be under 1.5 and be done with it? 1.5 is a pretty magical number. One, it reduced your durability warranty risk. Two, it reduced your customer compliance. Three, it's the single most cost-effective way of getting your gigajoules or your millions of BTUs down. And that becomes a huge element as you're trying to get to net zero construction or zero energy construction. If you can get to 1.5, lots of other things can change in the net zero conversation. So that's the important part. Just a little example of that. In climate zone five, in a 2,350 square foot, two-story home, Going from three air changes to 1.5 saves nine gigajoules or nine million BTUs. It's slightly different. Don't don't um, you know the conversion is slightly off, but at nine to ten million BTUs. That's the equivalent in that house of adding R10 of continuous insulation to the outside. In fact, R10 in this house only saved us about five to six million BTUs or gigajoules. So what's more cost effective? Putting foam on the outside, which we love, by all means do it, but what should you do first? Should you do the air tightness first and then work out the process kinks? We all know the cost, well, you should know the cost of that foam. Of two inches of foam on the outside, it's five, 6,000 bucks. Still want you to do it, need you to do it by 2030. But first I'd like you to get to and think about, let's do the air tightness. Let's remind ourselves the air tightness has other advantages with respect to customer expectations, code, and so on. So that optimization. Other little examples. Um, getting that air tightness from three down to 1.5 is roughly the same as putting your ducts in conditioned space. That is, we all know that we need and want to get ducts in conditioned space in the south. Absolutely, we need to do that. Getting that air tightness level from three down to 1.5 has roughly the same benefit of putting your ducts into kitchen space. Now, you know there's ways getting ducts in conditioned space. Spray foam's one way, spray foam the attic. The other way, of course, is to do drop ceilings, ductwork and floor joists, but they have cost implications, process implications. Air tightness is on par with that. Down at the bottom, air tightness is roughly the same as adding R60 into the attic and R20 to R25 in the basement combined. That is, you get more bang for a buck out of putting making your house air tight than you do of putting more insulation in attics and more in basements. And I want to be really clear here. I'm not saying don't do those things. By all means, do those things. You are going to have to do them. But understand that air tightness is at least as important as those and, in fact, should be done first. The reason you haven't done it first is because you could never predict in your energy models. Every energy rater is going to tell you. Yeah, if you could, if you knew you're going to be at one one point five, I could model it that. But you guys aren't at one point five, so I better model it at something higher. That's the angst over this: is knowing what your numbers can be at. If you only knew what your number could be, then we need to understand there is an application. I was just on a call literally this morning. Large houses, 3,500 square foot houses. A great builder. Um, the HVAC guy was on the call. We modeled the house at uh, three air changes, 3.5 air changes. Sorry. Um, and because that's what we have for code, he then modeled at 1.5. The furnace went from a 60,000 B2 furnace to 42,000. So in other words, a furnace size change from 60 down to a 45. And as the HVAC contractor pointed out, he said, that's not gonna save you much on the furnace size. There's not a lot of difference between a train 60,000 and a train 45,000. That's 75 bucks or hundred bucks. But he said, the big difference is the size of the ductwork. Now the duct works smaller. Now I can fit it, don't have to do bulkhead to fit it in storage systems. You in the south are gonna say, does it change my air conditioning size? Not huge. The air conditioning sizing isn't huge, but it's important to understand it rationalizes some sizing, mainly because of moisture control. You need to understand that air leakage in southern climates is responsible for the introduction, air leakage, is responsible for the introduction of as many as 20 to 40 pints of moisture per day into the air via air leakage. So when I can do more airtight, I can think a little bit about rationalizing my AC system, 
in terms of moisture control. I don't have to size for latent as much. So there might be half a ton there, or at least there's not the angst of managing, having to manage that moisture nearly as much. So you're starting to see these optimization challenges. And as a little example, the difference between a really nice um, dry, comfortable 50% RH and a sticky, muggy 65% RH is just six to eight pints per day in the sorry, six to eight pints in the air. So by simply reducing the amount of moisture that's coming in by air leakage, you can take a house from sticky and uncomfortable down to pretty manageable and dry. So keep those things in mind. Now you are going to ask, I'm near finished, but you are going to ask, yeah, but what about ventilation? Here's what you need to know. Your code already requires ventilation. It has for years. If you're under five air changes as a code requirement, you already have to provide hold house ventilation. And if you're already providing hold house ventilation, which you are, then you can go ahead and make the house as tight as you want. I need to be really clear on that. There's a lot of evidence on this, that if you go ahead and make houses to, uh, put in ventilation, oops, sorry, in accordance with ASHRAE 62.2, um, have a look at that three-bedroom house uh, up to 3,000 square feet. If you put in as little as 60 CFM of continuous ventilation, you can go ahead and make the house as tight as you want. How do we know this? State of Minnesota, state of Washington, all of Canada have had ventilation requirements since 1990, and we know that this amount of ventilation means you can go ahead and make the house as tight as you want. It's a code requirement. You're already doing it. Understand that all houses, new or old, tight or loose, need mechanical ventilation make sure it's properly sized obviously i'd like it to be an erv or an hrv doesn't have to be just make sure you put in the capacity for continuous ventilation so to finish up the optimization one you're going to optimize materials and labor no more wasted effort go back to your contracts folks and see what you're already paying for air sealing work that probably isn't doing much good two it'll help you smooth out production that is, you will know that it's one trade doing this work. It's it's half day's work that you know you can solve this without having to go back in the case of passive host guys having to go back for two or three weeks to sort that out. Three, you get to optimize your HVAC sizing. There's a few hundred dollars here uh, available to you, maybe more than that, depending on the size of the houses that you're building. Or you can optimize other energy elements. That is, which ones do you do first, which ones do you do second. No doubt in my mind, you'll be putting foam insulation on the outside of houses someday. But is this is that the one you should be doing first? So you get to optimize or rationalize against attic insulation, drain water, heat recovery, more efficient furnaces, so on and so on. Get your air tightness done. And then remind yourself there is a bucket of money that, that you need to recognize for moisture durability, both in the south, so that you don't have more moist air leaking into houses, and in the north, more moist air leaking into cold cavities. You need to add some budget number for that. Two, understand customer expectations. We know you get the odd warranty complaint. I get them all the time here. Warranty complaints about moisture, warranty complaints about noise, dust leakage, drafts, cold complaints, so on and so on. So that's that optimization. And of course, understand that code requirements keep changing. Uh, you are gonna be asked to do more and more. And just to get rid of that angst, I'm always reminded, Paul, you and I were out, I think I have one slide left, maybe I'll bring you back in. I'm reminded you and I were at a large production builder site in Atlanta. It happened to be closing day. They had not met their air tightness test requirements. So they have the energy rater there, they have the handyman, they have the site super, and they have the senior VP of construction all marching through the house, all with a belt on, with cans of foam caulking and tape, running the blower door, trying to keep the house below its three chain per, uh, per hour requirement. Don't tell me that this isn't costing you money or causing you stress. They were all doing it in good humor, by the way. They weren't complaining. They all wanted to meet the air tightness requirement. They had a tremendous attitude. And it was like, yes, yeah, we got to do this on every now and again. We just don't meet the requirement. We want to get this done. So my, in my estimation, this is a game-changing technology that you have to try. If you invest in this, you will find that it's cost neutral. I say invest because the first house is going to be more expensive. No two ways about it. But after that, you're going to say, hey, 
It sped up my production time. I stopped wasting time on Cox, foams, tapes, time and money. And But you are going to have to challenge designers and consultants and trades and how it would change their world. Make sure the HVAC contractor knows that every house is going to be under 1.5 or 2, whatever you want it to be. It's a productivity improvement that industry needs. Uh, there's that house that I said we got down to 0 0.06 air changes per hour. This is a builder who's been building under one air change for over 30 years. He was shocked to find there was still some work to do. He loved the fact that we got under 0 .06, uh, 0 0.06 or at 0 0.06. Pretty powerful, right? Uh, hopefully you like that. Paul, I, I said come on back in and we have a few minutes for questions. Anything on the chat that we should talk about? Yes, thank you. So we have a lot of good questions on the chat here. Um, first off, Gord, thank you. Um, I appreciate everything that you shared. Um, if it's all right with you, we'll just tag team some of these questions and go from there. Absolutely. So the first one we have is what's the ideal temperature and humidity for the system? So on the temperature side, it's really more about it freezing. Um, the sealant is water-based, um, so it, it does get impacted when it starts getting below freezing temperatures. That doesn't stop us from sealing, but it does require us to incorporate a couple new steps or different steps into the sealing process just to ensure that space is heated adequately when we start to atomize the sealant that it doesn't freeze in the house. The nice thing about the aero barrier system is it has a heater built into it. So on the blower door, we've actually incorporated three uh, heaters. So our system can control the temperature and the humidity inside a structure as we're sealing the house. Um, as Gord showed, sometimes when it does get colder, we do bring in ancillary heaters that can help uh, supplement the heater of the system itself. But the system will control the temperature to the best of its ability. Um, and cold weather is not going to stop us from doing the sealing work. It's just going to add a little bit, of, a little, or a couple more steps to that process. And as far let me, as let me add, sorry, sorry, let me add to that, Paul. Let me add to that. It, it actually likes cold weather because that air is actually dry, right? By the time I warm it up, as long as I warm that air up, it's actually dry air, which means I can add more sealant into the air. Mm -hmm. So it actually seals quick in, quicker in colder weather. The issue becomes in hot, humid weather that because I, I wanna be, ab be able to add sealant without causing condensation. Again, we'd like to actually heat the inside of the house. So it's not the outside temperature that's an issue, it's about controlling the inside temperature to make sure we can add as much sealant as possible. Yep, thanks, Gord. Yeah, and about the humidity, it's to go to its point, as it gets warmer, it can hold more moisture, but it's also, also typically got more moisture in it, right? So we're trying to control the temperature and the moisture um, to the psychometric chart that Gord shared to find a balance where we can seal without saturating the home. Um, and kind of to tag on to that, one of the questions was about the sealant. Um, the sealant itself is water-based. If you think of most of the caulks or sealants that you use in your homes today, most of them are solvent-based. Aero Barrier X1 is a water-based sealant material, um, so it's inherently a little bit healthier, especially because we are going to atomize it in the house. It's also Green Guard Gold certified, which is a UL rating. Um, it mostly pertains to schools and hospitals, but obviously the occupants in those homes or in those spaces are a little bit more susceptible to chemicals and airborne pollutants. So if it's safe to be used in those environments, we believe it's safe to be used in homes. Um, and then it has all the ASTM or NFPA requirements for smoke and flame spread um, or durability that you would expect from this type of product. So Gord, I'll let you jump into this one. Um, when, is the, when is the best time in the building process to air seal? I know you talked a little bit about it, um, but um, Bob had a question about when the best time to do it was. And if you use, hold on one second. If you use fiberglass insulation, is it better to air seal outside the insulation to reduce, eliminate air wash within the insulation? Um, two really good questions. Uh, first, um, it depends again on your air barrier, but I'll go back to this. We find in northern climates, we like doing an inside air barrier approach primarily because you got the drywall on, the uh, insulation's in, drywall's on, which means the building has heat. And so we like that. So from a process perspective, we tend in the northern climate tend to do an interior barrier that's been our history anyway and so we like to do it just after first 
uh, first coat of mud on the drywall. Is, there, is, there's a nice timing element there that seems to fit into builders' um, uh, schedules. They tend to know when that's happening. It gives us enough notice. So while they're taping, in, in, the, in the drying steps of taping, then we're going to do air bear. Um, in terms of the insulation, we like the insulation being in the building so you can have the building uh, heated. But in terms of exterior air bear, yes, you do want an exterior air bear. I, ideally, the outside of your building would be airtight and the inside of your building would be airtight. Both would be airtight. Um, so an exterior air bear is a great idea. If you're using aero barrier with an exterior air bear, like a, say a foam sheathing or a weather resistant barrier or even the OSB sheathing, uh, uh, aero bear is going to work really well with that. We would say put it in, be, do aero bear before the fiberglass goes in the wall cavity because you want the aero barrier sealant to have direct access to that outside air bear. So you don't want it to have to go through the insulation to find the hole in the OSB. So typically you would do it before you'd put the cavity insulation in. Hopefully that answers. Yeah, just to jump in here quickly, you know, the beauty of aero barrier, as Gord mentioned, is the flexibility that it brings. So from rough end to fully finished house, aero barrier can come in and air seal that property. Um, you know, in single family detached applications, rough end could be an option if it's a, a, a conditioned attic space. Um, if it's a vented attic, we typically go after first bit of drywall mud, but for multifamily, um, when you're talking about compartmentalization and some of the requirements there, we like to come in after first bit of drywall mud because the air sealing details at the party wall are often pretty challenging. Um, so multi-family applications will come in after first coat of mud and seal each individual unit uh, separately so that we can meet those compartmentalization requirements. Great point. Great point. Yeah, that's that's a really nice one. Yes. And Gord, real quick, another question from Bob. Is it effective to use aero barrier before and after sheetrock um, to seal up that cavity? Oh, I see. We, we've we had actually double applications. We have some passive house folks who go, you know, I, I'd really love you to come and do a, a, a quick application uh, so that it's, it's hitting the exterior bear and then wanting to come back and do an inside seal after. So the answer is sure. Um, you know, if you're trying to achieve very high levels or very low levels of air leakage, uh, high levels of air tightness, uh, nothing wrong with doing both. Yeah, so the question we have, can we use this after installation in sheetrock um, and do without the conventional air sealing um, if we're using fiberglass insulation on the ceiling and floors? And I'll jump in here quick and let Gord follow on. I would tell you at minimum, you need to continue to do the top plate. Um, once the drywall is in place, that top plate is going to be concealed and, and not going to be accessible for aero barriers. So there are certain things like the top plate that you need to think through and probably continue to air seal, or at least we would recommend you to continue to air seal. Um, but outside of that, if you're talking about junction boxes, can lights, uh, manual air sealing like that, those are the type of things that you can start removing from your build process um, at that stage. And Paul, that's why I use that word invest. When you invest in this process, then you, the first house, you're just going to try and see what happens. The second house, you're going to say, hey, let's stop doing that. Let's stop doing this. Um, or let's have a look around the house and see if there's things that we know are wasted effort. And as you get four or five houses into it, then you go, okay, I get it. As long as we get these big holes done, the seal time is really cost effective. That, that infill site that I talked about that we did, um, the, the, not the rescue job, but the 38 uh, net zero ready houses that we did. Oh, have I lost you? No, we're still here. My, okay. Um, when when we did that 38, the houses started at four and a half or so, um, and we got them under 1.5. But by the time we'd finished the site, the builder had gotten them down to three. It actually taken work out, but actually gotten the houses to three. Took stuff out of his process but we helped him understand where the important places for him to seal is, and then we were able to get them under one from there on. So it, it's a, a bit of play here. It won't take you long. It'll be three, four houses, five houses, somewhere in that range, especially it's production builders, and you'll find the sweet spot for all of these, uh, for these issues. Yeah, and we have a couple more questions here about the sealant. The first one is VOC and off-gassing. So aero barrier is an inert sealant. 
There is no chemical reaction occurring. There's no reaction that's causing the sealing to occur. So there is no, no elevated off-gassing or any concerns for off-gassing because there is no chemical reaction. Um, it is actually classified as ultra low VOC um, on the, in, the, in that category. Um, so really low on the VOC scale um, and no off-gassing because it is an inert sealant. And then the other question we always get is about the durability of the sealant. So we have done all the standard lab tests that you would expect for a product like ours. Um, we've done the 50 year wear test. We've done compatibility with different building materials. Um, in those tests, you know, for the 50 year wear test, we apply the technology or the sealant on various products that are found in the built environment. And then it goes up really high in temperature, then it comes back down and they freeze it and it comes back up and they put various pressures on that joint. And at the beginning of that process, our sealant was at 99.9% .9 effective, which is what you would expect from a new seal. Um, after the simulated 50 year wear test, it was at 99.87. Uh, so very little seal degradation in that application. Obviously that's a lab setting. Um, we have a couple of builders in the marketplace that are doing infield testing for us. Uh, Gord mentioned Mandalay Homes. They sealed their first house with us over two years ago. Um, when we sealed that house, the final test out for it was 0 0.6 ACH50. Uh, we tested that unit um, a couple months back, so almost two years since we applied the technology and it tested out at 0 0.7 ACH50. So again, really, uh, with the blower doors, the, the tool as it is, it's inherently going to give you different readings with ambient temperature and different, um, different things going on outside the house. But we feel good about 0.7 ACH versus 0.6 ACH when it talks about the leakage of that home over two years. And Paul, I'll reiterate that too. We've had the opportunity and now in our two years to retest, I think it's three houses. Yeah, exactly three houses. And we've seen basically, as you say, within errors of uh, uh, margin margin of error, we've seen basically the same result, 1.4 to 1.43. Uh, a, a, an existing house would start at six, we got it down to 2.6. Uh, then she did a little bit of work and it's now at 2.7, you know, in that, so same orders of magnitude. <clears throat> So one of our integrators on the call is asking if we want to go to 1.5 ACH50, can we still guarantee that it's going to um, perform at 1.5 um, when it's operated as opposed to the enclosure test when it's at an operated test, can we still guarantee 1.5? That, that's a great question. You're going to have to judge um, for yourself a little bit. I, I will say this, um, our reaction is Every bathroom fan leaks at the rate of about 12 CFM. So if you've sealed, and we've actually done this measurement, 12, 12 to 20 CFM, depending on the bathroom fan, some are better, some are worse. As a, as a little example, Brone has just come out with a bathroom fan that has much tighter damper and much tighter seals to it because they've understood this issue. But it, you can imagine in a really tight house, if I had four bathroom fans, each leaking at 15 CFM, that's an extra 60 CFM, that's gonna skew your results. Or what about your windows? How good are your windows? Because you've sealed off the sashes. Our experience has been that it's in the range of 0.4 uh, variance, 0.4 error changes. Um, Scott and Brian are going to probably nudge me a little bit and say you shouldn't be so definitive uh, because it might vary more or less than that. Uh, but that's been our experience. So if you want to guarantee 1.5 finish, then typically you would say, then I'll be under one under error barrier which still is an issue from our perspective, just get under one. Now now you take off the tapes and so on and you're 1.5. So that'll give you the order of magnitude. Then you're gonna have to do some work yourselves, research a little bit, depending on your builder, what are they using, how many penetrations did you have to seal and so on. So we have a lot of questions about retrofit applications, and I'll tell you that retrofit applications are one of the best applications for aero barrier, especially if there's a renovation where you're adding a new structure onto an existing structure. There can be a lot of challenges in being able to get to the areas that you want to seal, whether you're taking the drywall out or not, or you know, just really how that, that existing structure is constructed against the new structure that you're building. Aero barrier is going to find all those leaks for you. You're not going to have to chase around leaks or try to figure out where leaks are occurring. 
it is a great application for retrofit or renovation applications um, where you're looking to create a, a better envelope or, or reduce air sealing in that space. I, I will add to that, Paul. When we initially looked at it, we thought, oh my God, that's a lot of work. I got to cover all the horizontal surfaces, right? Either that or I got to be ready to clean. That said, it's the only way to do an existing house. There's 13 million existing houses in Canada. There's 135 million existing houses in the US. And we have tried many times under many weatherization programs to seal those houses. Uh, the Wisconsin Energy Conservation Center had a weatherization program. Tacoma, Washington had a weatherization program. Canada had one. We tested over a million houses and found it really difficult to air seal an existing house. You, you're spreading beads of caulk and tape around an existing house. You have no idea where to put them. Air barrier finds those holes for you. So our initial reaction was nobody's going to want to pay for this because it's the prep time. Now what we're finding, it's not that bad. We can prep the house as you know. I'm going to say you're not going into grandma's house and doing it with her sitting in the easy chair. No, it's somebody who's renovating, who's pretty much got their contents out or their contents covered, say in the basement under plastic, and maybe they're redoing some flooring and they're redoing some cabinets. Okay, this is a perfect time. I'll say it again, there's no other way to do an existing house than air barrier. You will never get an existing house that tight uh, or anywhere close to that tight without air barrier. Thank you, Gordon. I'm gonna tee this one up for you, Gord. Um, are there any sorts of changes that should be made to home construction if the air leakage is brought down low, i.e. 0.75 ACH 50? Obviously an HRV or ERV is required, but does anything else need to change since the home will operate differently in terms of building science? Right, and, and thank you for that. That's sort of that long-term, and I'll just take it in order. First, combustion safety. Okay, so I'd want direct vent sealed combustion appliances. If I have a wood burning appliance, I can still do that, but I have to be very careful of makeup air. So I have to worry about combustion spillage of uh, or combustion safety. Second, I do need to ventilate, but all houses need to be ventilated. So you're gonna bump from a, if you're just doing, I don't know, a fresh air intake and an exhaust fan, you bump that up to an ERV, HRV, but you're gonna be there anyway. The code's going to get you there in the United States. You know, it took us 30 years to make code, HRV's code in Canada and Minnesota. The, the rest of the country is going to do it in seven or eight years. So you're going to be there anyway. You already have to ventilate. And then you do need to worry a little bit about makeup here. You want to put in a large range hood. I can tell you in my house, I turn on the range hood and the range hood goes, Dee! it just can't find any air. So you are going to have to put in makeup air. Well, what's makeup air? It's a hole. It's a hole that only opens when the range hood comes on. Again, a great partner of ours at, at CI is Brown. They now sell as a standard option. Anytime you sell, buy a large range, they're gonna encourage you to buy a makeup air device. And it's a damper that opens somewhere in the house, doesn't really matter where. Um, and it's linked to the operation of the range hood. When the range hood goes on, damper opens, bring the air in, then it closes back up again when the air is off, uh, when the fan is off. So those are the three building science issues. I'll put it another way. If you don't do air tightness, then you have to be careful about adding insulation. You have to be careful about furnace sizing. You have to be careful about windows, so on and so on. So if you do it in that order, combustion safety first, you're already doing ventilation. The next thing on the building science list is air tightness. Then you can go ahead and put in more insulation. And now you can put in more efficient furnace. And now you can put in better windows, so on and so on. Perfect. And we have a couple questions here about cleanup. And um, you know, the, the nice thing about aero barrier is it really doesn't impact vertical surfaces. So you know, when we're done with an application, um, you can go in and rub the drywall and you'd really never know we were there. So vertical surfaces don't typically have to be uh, protected or, or worried about in the application. You know, when you think about windows, we do want to protect some of the joints or the moving parts. Maybe there's a weep hole. Um, obviously, anything that we don't want sealed, we do want to protect. And then to Gord's point, the only other thing that we really pay attention to is finished horizontals, right? And it's not because the sealant is just going to collect there as it's sealing, but when we turn off the blower door, any sealant that's left in that space is going to fall to the ground or, or the closest horizontal surface. So we will protect the finished horizontal just for cleanup purposes. Um, but at the end of the day, the cleanup is pretty minimal. Um, and 
there may be a little bit of tackiness on the floor, but it's not an extended extreme amount and it's not something that you typically have to worry about. And I'll, I'll concur. Uh, I don't want to sugarcoat it. There are the odd case, um, a nozzle that kind of impinges on a wall, in, incorrectly uh, in, incorrectly located. You know, we've we've had to scrub off drywall in one case. We had, un, unbeknownst to us, an HRV. Most HRVs have dampers built into them. This was a cheap one that didn't. And so the core of the HRV got contaminated, tried to seal the holes of the core inside the HRV, which was annoying. Um, but so there are some anomalies, some weird ones, but in general, the cleanup has been very minimal, very minimal. All right, Gord, I got one for you from Ireland. Um, Ireland, has Aero, yeah, Ireland, has Aero Barrier been tried out on block built masonry building? I would imagine this could avoid applying the skim coat to the block before drywall. Um, it's a great question. Um, We've done one townhouse block that had uh, uh, that had a uh, block wall every sixth unit. And you're right, those can be pretty leaky, and in fact, were very leaky. Um, and so, yes, it could seal it. You are going to end up parch coating it or drywalling it anyway, probably, depending on aesthetics. But yes, the, I see no reason why air barrier wouldn't be uh, really good at sealing up the inherent holes of concrete block. Perfect. And one of the, the common questions that we get is how much does it cost? <laughs> so, so Aero Barrier is priced on a square foot basis typically. And, uh, you know, it's hard to answer that question. And it's really just because we don't know what the desired outcome is. The price to get to 3 ACH 50 is going to be very different than the price to go to 0. 0.6 ACH 50. And the price for a house that's starting at 12 ACH is going to be very different than a house that's starting at 4 ACH, right? So there's a lot of variables there that we need to work through with you. Um, and all pricing is controlled by our local installers. But I can tell you somewhere between a buck 25, buck 35 is going to be a good budget number for you. Um, you know, we have some builders that are way below that based on the volume that they provide or volume that they build. And frankly, we have some builders that are that are higher than that based on the projects that they're doing. So I would tell you a buck 25 is a good budget number to start with, but I would implore you to connect with your local installer because they're the ones that are going to be able to help you work through that. And to Gord's point, they're also going to be the ones that will help you understand how to make it cost neutral, what things can be removed from the process, and they'll be the ones that will be working with you through the process to in incorporate or integrate aero barrier into your build process. I, I can tell you with, with a high degree of assurance, well, I'll speak to the production builders. You guys get this. This is a, a, a process issue, a process issue. You guys will know, like every trade, there's a cost to show up, just to mobilize the truck and the gear and the equipment. Then there's the cost of the actual sealant. Okay, that doesn't vary much, but it, as, as um, Paul indicated, if I got to use a lot of sealant to get a house from 12 down to one, okay, we're, we're going to help you and say, you don't want us using sealant to do that. You want to use a can of foam to do that. And then there's the seal time itself. How many can we do in a day? So production builders, you know, I can do one a day, I can do three a day. We've, we're quite reliably now able to do three a day. Now the show up cost is cut by two thirds, right? Because we only have to show up once to do three houses. That's why I use the word invest. Like every other technology you've ever invested in, the first house, the second house, the cost is gonna be higher. And then you're gonna work out the processes and you're gonna work out, here's stuff we should do to be ready. Here's stuff we should do. Here's the sweet spot of when to install it. Here's the notice that you guys need to get to that volume. And we already have builders, builders who are doing 50 to 120 houses a year who will tell you it's cost neutral now that after less than a year they're at cost neutral perfect so we got a, a builder from florida using concrete block uh, foam insulation is underside of the roof would it make sense to use aero barrier directly after windows and doors are in and after foam insulation but prior to drywall my answer would be yes. I, I think it's, well, and there might be an Arab barrier dealer from there, but I would be anxious to try that on a house and see where you got to. I think 
the concrete block, oddly enough, it's not a great air barrier, but but it's solid enough and it's a good seal base. So as long as your major penetrations are done, your windows are in, I actually, I would be trying that right off the bat. Thank you. So the question is, how long have we been sealing multifamily units and how many units have been done? So we've been sealing multifamily units since we started. Um, I can tell you we've done thousands of units. Um, currently, just off the top of my head, I can tell you we're actively doing a 600 unit apartment complex in Utah, a 230 unit apartment complex in Washington State. We have 795 units in Colorado. We have 260 units in New York, and we have a couple hundred units in Boston, just to name some of the projects that we're actively working on here in the States. Um, but that is one of the best applications for aero barrier. Like we mentioned, air sealing the party wall can be a huge challenge. Um, and that air sealing detail can, can give you a little bit of a headache. Aero barrier can completely remove that challenge and ensure that each of those units are meeting the requirements um, of whatever certification you're on. You know, a lot of the New York projects that we're doing today are passive house projects, um, one of which has failed all the units um, that, that they're currently trying to certify. So we're going in after finishes and getting that those units to less than uh, 0.6 ACH. Um, but it is a great application for multifamily um, projects. All right. If I use aero barrier, do I remove the need for a roof vent? If so, is this process recognized by inspectors and reviewers? Mm, I think we're mixing and matching here. Um, the, the idea of a roof vent has more to do with conditioned attic versus unconditioned attic. That is, where's your thermal barrier? So if you're doing a conditioned attic, uh, attic with an unvented roof deck, then you can remove the vent. Aero barrier could be part of that. So most do it with spray foam, but air barrier and spray foam, or there are some net and blow systems. So you would do air barrier first, use the roof deck itself as the air barrier, and then blow your insulation up to that if you didn't want to use foam. So it, it's not really an aero barrier question. It's more of a design question. Are you doing a condition, unvented attic assembly? It, it, that, that ties with that. And most building officials are pretty familiar with that now in climate zones where these are popular. That would help you understand whether you're allowed to do a vented attic under one conditions. Air barrier is not really part of that equation, uh, other than it's just trying to improve the air tightness, which actually improves the whole performance of that unvented attic. So real quick, we have multiple questions about how do you become an installer or how should you engage with aero barrier? I would tell you the easiest way to do so is jump on our website. Um, you can go to www.aeroseal.com forward slash aero barrier. Um, or if you just type in aerobarrier.net, um, it'll take you to the landing page there and you can click in the top right corner um, and get more information about becoming an installer in your market. Um, I would That'd be the easiest way to go about doing it. And then we'll have someone from our team get in contact with you um, and work through it from there. Do they put in a promo code? Do, do they put in a promo code so I get my commission on those? Or? Yes, all the ones in Canada. <laughs> um, let's see. So, real quick, just clarification: the dollar twenty-five per square foot is floor area, not surface area. So, whatever the livable, livable square foot of that home is, that's the what the price is based on. And obviously, that is. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. A shout out to the air barrier dealers. I'm going to say that will vary. There's different formulas, but it's a good starting point when you think about what size of investment we're talking about. It's it's not hundreds, it's not tens of thousands, it's in the thousands, and and you can make it cost neutral over time. All right, let me see. Any information regarding embodied carbon of the sealant? as it's compared to standard foam and caulk sealing methods. So Ooh, can I that is, yeah, so Gord <laughs> is very interested in this question. Um, we, for those of you who know Tremco, um, Tremco is our partner in the aero barrier sealant. So Tremco produces the sealant for us and, and is our sealant partner in developing the sealant that we use. 
they are actively working on that question for us. Um, I'll tell you, I don't have a good answer for you today, but we're, we are working on it. And that is something that we've thrown back to Tremco to help us understand. Um, and we will share that information as we get it back from that group. We have a, we've enlisted a help from a, one of the major carbon counting consultants here in Canada. And he was kind of intrigued by the fact that it's so little material that's actually going into the house, right? He said, there's, there's probably more carbon contribution to the diesel fuel that you're running on the heater than there is to the actual sealant. Because remember, it's a pail of sealant, five gallon pail, 70% of which is water. So the actual amount of sealant is very, very small. Um, so that's, that's what we need to keep in mind. So the number is going to be exciting when you see it. All right, so it looks like we got one more here for you, Garda. I'm building a house with fast wall insulated block. The exterior has reveal shield rain screen material. Closed cell insulation under the roof. Would our application be better prior to sheetrock or after first coat of mud? Because of that fast wall that you're using, I would take advantage of that. You know, you're going to have a, basically an airtight enclosure before you drywall. So I would just go ahead and try it at that location. Again, I would talk to your air, local air barrier dealer he'll come out and have a quick look and make sure that the ceiling is uh, sorry that the air barrier is substantially complete but that technique that building technique uh penalized type system is ideally suited for doing it before drywall and gord i'm interested in this comment it actually just came in at a dollar 25 per square foot for a 3500 square foot house that's over four thousand dollars Contractors in my area will not pay for this because they can achieve three ACH a lot less expensive. How do you overcome this? Well, I, I'm with that. The point is, I don't want you to be a three ACH. I want you to go to one ACH uh, or one and a half and, and find the synergies associated with that. That is that three air changes is a nice idea. That's minimum code. If you have a builder just wants to do minimum code and doesn't want to do any optimization and make his houses more cost effective to build, Okay, you're right. He's not the right. He's not, he or she's not the right builder. But this is, of course, what we're working with every day: is understanding what builders' goals and objectives are, where are they trying to get to, where do they see the code going, what are they putting in their houses now, how are they achieving that three air changes? Some builders are going to say, "Well, I achieve three air changes, but yeah, I, I have to use eight thousand dollars with a spray foam or something along those lines." Okay, let's let's continue to use spray foam, but let's maybe use less of it and use air barrier in these applications or now that we're airtight um, maybe we don't need to worry about as much wall insulation or maybe we don't need to think about a uh, heat pump whatever whatever i i'm still saying we can get you there uh, i would say four air changes is a nice number depending on your climate sorry three air changes is a nice number but one and a half is even better and you're going to have to be there someday anyway you're going to want to be there someday anyway so let's find out what the builder's goals are I, you know, this is exactly the challenge I've had in my entire career. Remember, I was selling something called a heat recovery ventilator, which at the time was $3,500 to install. How many builders wanted to use it? Well, it's not required by code. I know it isn't, but let me help you with this. Let's understand the science. Where do you want to go as a company? So let's ask ourselves, those on the call, builders, architects, designers, where are you now? Where would you like to be three years from now? And where does this technology fit in? It's... Uh, this is one of the most exciting technologies I've seen. You will all be doing this someday. You will, well, I'll put it another way. You will all be under one and a half air changes 10 years from now. You, you're just gonna be. Why? Because it's the single most cost-effective thing with the lowest risk, reduces your liability, reduces your risk, improves comfort, uh, so on and so on. And yet it's so cost-effective to do. So you're all gonna be doing it. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. So that's what you need to do is help those builders with. When do you wanna do this? Not if. Thank you, sir. So last question, um, will it do any harm to the mud for this, as it relates to the second coat of mud and uh, any harm to finishes in place such as finished painting or stained windows? Um, do finish units need to be completely covered? Finish, again, remember, it's horizontal surfaces. It's not gonna do any damage to the walls and the, uh, the, the paint on the walls. It's not gonna do any damage to the second coat of mud. It, what it what it would it, there'll be this sticky residue it's just sticky imagine this if if it's a subfloor that's down the drywall dust is on there 
when you sweep up the drywall dust, you're sweeping up the air barrier dust. It's just slightly tagged. If, however, somebody wanted in put in early, I don't know, a countertop or a cabinet, okay, you don't want to have to clean that. You can clean it. It's entirely cleanable, but you don't want to clean it. It's easier to cover with a sheet of plastic. So you drape a sheet of plastic over top of it, um, and so you're rolling up the plastic rather than elbow greasing the little sticky coating up. It's not difficult to clean. We've literally, other than that HRV where we've replaced the core of the HRV because that's hard to clean, we've not been in a situation where it wasn't cleanable. It's just you just want to cover because it's easier to cover than it is to clean. All right. Well, that was a <laughs> pretty exhaustive list. Gord, I yeah, appreciate thanks. your time today. Thank you very much for, for all that you do. Um, again, anybody that's still on the call with us, if you have additional questions or you would like to reach out, you can obviously find more information um, at our website. Um, also, if you want to email me directly, you can email me at paul.springer, S-P-R-I-N-G-E-R, um, at aeroseal.com. That's A-E-R-O-S-E-A-L.com. And I'll be happy to answer any additional questions that you might have. Again, Gord, thank you for your time today. I appreciate it. Um, everybody on the phone, I appreciate you spending this time with us. Hopefully it was valuable and um, hopefully we'll connect with you all soon. Thank you and have a good day. And Paul, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you.